Welcome to Leading with Curiosity. Command and control leadership is dead. We interview leaders, entrepreneurs, and executive coaches challenging old paradigms and fostering cutting edge leadership. Here's your host, certified executive coach, Nate Leslie. Hello listeners. In a world where speed, outcomes, and achievement rule, and where health means fitting into your skinny jeans, my guest's new book, You Should Leave Now, possesses a revolutionary wellness solution, Transformational Personal Retreats. Bree Doyle believes that the practice of retreat is one of the pillars of wellness and provides a powerful shift to bring fresh perspective and renewed energy. She's the founder of She Glows Retreats, and a mindfulness teacher of over 20 years. I'm excited to share her vibrant wit and wisdom with you today. Bree, welcome to Leading with Curiosity. Thanks so much for having me. I'm honored to be here. Great. Uh, You know, you are another guest from Boulder, Colorado. Uh, (laughs) There's a strong connection of really cool people there. I really need to get there. (laughs) Yeah, you should come out here. There's a lot of great people here. Vancouver too, though. I need to get out there. (laughs) Yeah, I think, I think they're kind of twin cities. I think there's some, (laughs) some commonality in why people live in these two places. I think so too. Let's start with the question. Just what does retreating mean to you? Yeah. So for me, retreating really means just pulling out of your day-to-day life, breaking away from the patterns and the, the, you know, the habitual thinking patterns and behavior patterns that we live daily to work on our inner life, to make space for space. And it can be anytime, you know, some people go for just a day, some people go for a weekend, or if they're lucky enough, even for a week or a month. So Mm -hmm. you pick the duration and just to pull out. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm, Pulling out. Yeah. And, and when did this start really becoming a, a big part of your value system? So I, um, I was raised Catholic, actually. And so my mom, when we were young, she told us about um, the Catholic nuns who would go live in these little yurts, actually, and just, you know, pray and focus on their inner life. And that always, like, I always was really interested in that, but I liked boys too much to, <laughs> to become a nun. So <laughs> yeah. that, 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 yeah. <laughs> that didn't work out for me. But, um, but then I studied abroad in college. I went to Nepal and I met a Buddhist meditation teacher. I think I was 19 years old and um, like went fully into the Buddhism thing, took refuge under him. And um, so for years was doing retreats um, under the Buddhist lineage, under the um, Vajrayana Buddhist lineage. So, hey. so it started, you know, there probably more concretely, I'd say, um, yeah. but then slowly sort of evolved over my lifetime. I mean, I um, did a re- at least one retreat a year until I started having kids. And then when I had kids, it was harder to pull away. And it was after my third kid that I realized, gosh, I've dropped this practice and I really, need it. So um, now it's become a more full force part of my life. And now it's my business too. <laughs> yeah, right on. And uh, gosh, this isn't a, a religious uh, religion podcast, but how did that, uh, <laughs> you know, how'd the family feel about that? <laughs> Which part, the Buddhist part or the? Yeah, sure. The, yeah. <laughs> right. I know um, my family, well, my, my family was a bit shocked, you know, and I came home from Nepal and I was like, you know, I'm a Buddhist now. <laughs> they were yeah. like, what? <laughs> um, so that was intense, but you know, religion, I mean, I know this is not a religious podcast, but I've kind of tried hard to fit into two religions and make them work for me. And I just have come to a place where religion is not, um, is not the right fit for me, I would say, but I'm yeah. deeply spiritual. I've taken a lot yeah. of lessons from both religions. Absolutely. But um, that's kind of part of my mission is to put retreating on the map for all folks. Um, you know, I think mm. traditionally it's been done in the past as more of a religious practice. And now it's retreating is getting a lot more press uh, for just regular everyday folks. So that's part of my mission is to really make it accessible to all people. Mm-hmm. My wife and I went to Nepal a few years ago and oh. tracked up sort of past uh past uh base camp and just to got you know uh the, the 17 days of walking retreat i guess and yeah. just realized the power of just really even that walking one step in yeah. front of the other for days on end a lot yes. happens yeah and that's a really special place too i mean nepal you know as you know it's a really sacred spot it's easy to like drop into you kind of reconnect with your spiritual roots whatever they might be religious or not just because it's such a spiritual place you know mm-hmm. and having mm-hmm. so much space and open fields to really just be by yourself or just with your wife or whoever you're with is, is pretty holy on its own yeah yeah it was amazing wow um tell us tell us about your book yeah, so my book, it's called You Should Leave Now, mm-hmm. <laughs> Going on Retreat to Find Your Way Back to Yourself. And 
Um, so it has four different sections. So the first section is kind of the call to retreat, like why people would need a retreat. There's a lot of research there. Um, you know, my feeling is that we hear a ton about mental health, the negative statistics, you know, the, all the um, mental health challenges that people are, ha are having, but we don't hear a lot about proactive practices for mental health. You know, all we hear for solutions regarding mental health are like pills. And I really am hoping to put retreating on the map as a form of like proactive self-care. So my first section of the book is about, you you know, research-based why we need retreating. Um, the second section of the book is like how to do it. So you either, you know, there's, you can do it by yourself or you can join an organized group. And so it's like figuring out what's best for you at this particular moment. And it might change, you know, one time you might want to do one by yourself. The next time it might be inspiring to join an organized group. So walking you through the how-to. Um, the third section is what actually happens while you're on retreat. Um, I believe there's what's called an energetic and emotional trajectory that happens, that happens the same every time you go on retreat, you hit the same stages. Mm. Um, so I, I kind of talk through that in my book. And then the final stage, the final um, section is about transitioning home because it's a real challenge for folks. You know, you've had this experience and you come home and how do you then reintegrate to your life back home? So my last section is about that. So yeah, so it just came out on Tuesday. <laughs> All right. Yeah, yeah, congratulations. And where can people find it? Thank you. So Amazon, I mean, you can get it from my website, which is just freedoyle.com. You can find mm -hmm. it from there, but you can buy it on Amazon or Barnes and Noble, indie bookstores. There's, I mean, you can get it really anywhere. Um, online is pretty easy. <laughs> What's that journey been like writing it and bringing it to that point where you've got it in your hands there? It's been awesome. It's it's a dream, really. You know, I, I'm a writer first. I actually started writing fiction, um, and that was kind mm -hmm. of my window into writing. And mm -hmm. I've always wanted to publish books, so it's really been a dream. I had my event on Tuesday when my book launch was called Dream in honor of the fact that, like, this is really a dream come true. And it's been awesome. I mean, I got my book deal, and then COVID hit, so it was really hard because then all three kids were home from school, and, you know, like, we didn't have daycare or any anything like that, so that was a bit crazy, but <laughs> it yeah. feels like a, you know, a big accomplishment to be on the other side of it and now have in front of me, so yeah, it's yeah. been awesome. For yeah. listeners listening to this whenever, we're kind of mid-July here, so that's just to give some context to that, that release date, right. and Gosh, getting the book deal and, and or the publisher, um, what was that uh, experience like from an entrepreneurial perspective? Yeah, I mean, you know, as a writer, it's so similar. You know, now that I you know own a business, there's so many parallels between like the creative path, entrepreneurial path. I mean, they're truly one and the same, but, um, you know, a lot of rejection at first and that's hard and you kind of have to toughen your skin and just be like, listen, this is a numbers game. I'm dedicated to this. And so a lot of sticking with it and perseverance and persistence, but um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's been great learning and a great experience and so much about connections too, you know, like meeting people, staying atop of what's happening in the industry, the, the writing world. And, you know, so it's very similar to the entrepreneurial journey for sure. Um, but it's been awesome. I mean, I feel like I've grown so much as a person and I feel like it gives me a, a great sense of confidence to have achieved this too, because it's something I've been after for so long, you know, people yeah. see it now and they're like, Oh, that's so nice. You're so lucky. And I'm like, well, you know, it's been 10 years. Like I've been wow. <laughs> trying wow. for a really long time to get published. So it's not, um, but you know, that self-belief, that self-determination is so um, important and just sticking with it, no matter what people say. So, yeah. So you kind of first put pen to paper, maybe started 10 years ago or the idea of one day I want to write a book pop 10 years ago. What, what's, what's that last decade been like? So I, again, I started with fiction. So I've written four fiction novels that have not been published. So over those years, uh -huh. I was writing novels and I had an agent in New York city and we were pitching some of my books and none of them got picked up. So it was kind of spinning in that world. And then this is my first nonfiction book. So I was like, and this came together very quickly, actually. I was quite shocked. Like I wrote the proposal, I entered actually a contest and I did well in the contest. I had a bunch of agent and um, editor interest. And from there, I got the deal, which is crazy because like I said, I've been you know years having someone represent me and pitching big publishing houses <laughs> with fiction. But I do think nonfiction is easier to sell than fiction, generally speaking, because it's so subjective fiction is. But, right. um, but I was like so delighted by the process because it was it was smoother than I would have thought. And I think, yeah. you know, that's as a result of being in it with fiction and knowing kind of the steps to take because I'd taken so many wrong steps the first many years. <laughs> so, yeah. For, for the entrepreneurs listening and the people striving to move towards something, I, I just wrote resilience on my page for unpublished 
books <laughs> and the the resilience and belief in in a fifth and it worked out that's that's uh you're probably not the only writer to experience that and it's right. worth noting pretty awesome yeah thank you thanks yeah yeah <laughs> and back to the value now of of the of retreating and the place we are in the world maybe maybe the timing's right maybe people are uh, more open to uh, consider that taking care of themselves is as important as putting up a shield and pretending that everything's fine. What do you say to that? I mean, I think so. I think COVID has been like a great equalizer in a sense. It's like everybody has struggled for different reasons. You know, it's like depending on where you are in your career, where you are in your relationship or your family. I mean, it's all of us have had different challenges. So I think, mm -hmm. you know, it's been a real eye opener to like what really matters. I also think some of the like, um, um, the habitual patterns of like so over socializing or things that we've done in the past that we didn't necessarily want to do has kind of dropped away, which is really nice. And people are seeking like deep meaning, deep connection, things that really matter now, now that we have a little more freedom to move about. So I think, you know, retreating is absolutely, in my opinion, the way to, to really hear yourself again. So I think it's a, a beautiful time to step into this practice and coming out of this crazy experience, stepping away and really reevaluating like what matters to me now? You know, cause I think that's what retreating offers is it gives us a chance to ask that question again, because we're constantly evolving. So we have to ask that question on the regular basis. Yeah. Otherwise we just plow through life with our head down, doing all the shoulds and have tos and expectations. And then yeah. we wake up and say, gosh, you know, this isn't me anymore. I don't really love this anymore. Or, you know, so I, I think yeah. retreating offers that in a really proactive way offers the value of like, to, to, to relook at your life again, that bird's eye view of like, what's working, what's not working, what do I need to shift? Where do I need to press the gas? Where do I need to pump the brakes? You know? Yeah. And I think people are, are seeking that, that meaning and that reconnection to like their power. Cause it's, it's been a draining experience for a lot of folks. I mean, um, COVID has, I mean, mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. I think people are looking for ways to connect to their power again. And I absolutely think retreating is one of the ways. Yeah. I'm drawing a parallel between the conversations I have with other families with young kids like mine, like what part of this kid rat race were we willing to put our kids in before when it was just yeah. kind of normal, which for my family was not full in, maybe one, right. one foot in. Right. And then COVID, like people saying, oh, oh, we suddenly have more time together. And this, these family experiences are actually amazing. Right. And, and now what level of the before times are we going to sort of submit ourselves and I'm hearing a similar similar parallel to what an individual has the opportunity to do coming out of COVID uh, hopefully and um, and also that the power of something like a retreat can do like what am I going to keep doing what am I going to stop doing and what do I need to start doing uh, totally after? Yeah. Totally. And I think, I mean, I think you're right. I think COVID is, was similar to a retreat in some ways. I mean, forced, <laughs> but yeah. this long time of like pulling back from things, it really did give time to reevaluate too. So of course there were upsides and challenges of COVID, but there were upsides too. And I think, I think that is an interesting parallel for sure. Yeah. yeah. We'll yeah. just put the asterisks in here. It's been awful for so many people, it's yeah. sort of needing to, um, not uh, not ignore that or put that right out there there are many uh yeah. yeah there's been a lot of reflecting though for those of us who maybe weren't haven't been hit as devastatingly for it and so there's always been crappy things going on in the world and so how can you use them to rethink what's really important and and your yeah. values and yeah. yeah absolutely you caught my attention at the four stages that people always go through with their energy and emotion at a retreat that you discuss in the book, what would you like to share about that here? Yeah. So, um, so I, I believe there's seven, I'm trying to think if there's seven, I can't remember all of them. I'm sorry, but I, um, but what I would say is that the first stage is, um, Oh, sorry. There's four sections of the book and sorry, there yeah, are four stages. Okay. Right. Gotcha, I know gotcha. there's so many, so many like. numbers, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so many numbers, but yeah, the yeah. stages, what's so fascinating about the stages and about knowing them is if you can come to expect them, then you're not blindsided by them when they actually hit. Mm -hmm. Um, what I, for years, I, I'm a journaler, you know, as a writer, I constantly journal. So for years I would take, I would journal on my retreats. And what I found is that I went through these same stages every single time I would go on retreat. And this is literally from like 20 years back, you know? So one of the first, um, 
the first stages is like reservation and, and hesitation because, you know, you, so, so let's say you decide to go on a retreat, you book a retreat, or you say you're going to go away for a week. As it starts to approach, you start to feel like, gosh, do I really have time for this? Can I really afford this? Do I really need this right now? It's like the almost you're almost talking yourself out of it. I mean, I've had women like or or men like break bones right before a retreat or like something like things externally will come up to try to test you. Like how committed to you are this uh, yes. are, to this experience are you? You know what mm-hmm. I mean? So mm-hmm. so that comes up, and I think knowing that is really helpful because when your retreat starts to come, it's time for you to leave, and you're feeling like I don't actually really want to go or I don't need this. To know that it's a stage is actually really helpful because it's normalizing mm-hmm. and. It's it's like, oh, okay, this is just a stage and it's normal for me to feel like I don't really mm. want to go or I'm trying cool. to back out. Yeah. Yeah. So, so yeah. that's, that's one to take note of. And then yeah. another one is once you actually arrive and you're, you know, you're on your retreat, there's this huge surge of emotion and elation and energy because you've done it. You're there. You're so excited to be there. You know, you're looking around and whether you're like outside and you're camping or maybe you're at a nice resort, wherever you're staying, it's like, I've, I'm doing this, you know? So there's a huge, like, peak in energy and in emotion. Um, and it, again, it's good to know that. And then, and then the third stage I would say is what I call hitting the wall. And this is, it, this will happen at different times for different folks, but what's important to know is that we all hit walls in our retreat. That's part of how you grow, but the wall will manifest in many different ways. Like sometimes it's like, oh, this climate is terrible. My bed is so uncomfortable. Um, I'm really bored. I want to check my email, mm. you know? So it, so everybody hits different walls based on kind of what their internal landscape looks like. But no matter how many years I've retreated, I always hit walls. It's just part mm-hmm. of my, it's part of the path of growing, right? So mm. your, your retreat will trigger you because you pull away all of, you strip away all of the comforts and the habit patterns that you've established back home. And then you you pull away and, and it's, it can be boring, you know, mm-hmm. or it can be quiet and those things are hard sometimes, but mm-hmm. if you stick with it, you know, the growth is on the other side of that. So, so what's so important about this trajectory is just knowing that it's there because then when they come, as I said, you know, you don't, you're not completely derailed by it. You're like, oh, okay, I'm just, I'm just hitting my wall or <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you, you, yeah. you give, give yourself a little more grace as opposed to leave the retreat or, you know what I mean? something like that. So those are just the first three. And as I said, you know, there are seven, but it really goes up from there. So you hit the wall and then on the other side of that wall is like beautiful wisdom. So it's it's staying with it when, when it hurts, when it hurts, when it's hard. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Those that, that human experience is gosh, I'm thinking of my kids, like going to a new summer camp this week. That is a human experience where you have all these opportunities to tell yourself to not do it. Yeah. Uh, then you're excited about it. You know, the email, for example, and the, oh, I'll just check in like this little stupid excuse we tell ourselves when we're on, yeah. even on holiday all the time. Right. And just, yes. yeah. And, and the growth of pushing through that. And yeah, oftentimes the world doesn't fall apart while we're gone. Yeah. And it's such a good reminder too to just, you know, to, to even send an email or, or, or a message to your people back home and just be like, thanks so much. I'll be home in a week. Um, I'm not going to check in until then just so that they can hold the boundary, but also so that you can hold the boundary. Cause again, once we get bored, it's like, well, I'll just send them a quick email or send them a quick photo, or I'll just check this one thing. And then it kind of pulls you out of the path again. And the whole yeah. idea is to strip away those patterns. So, um, so yeah. So I think it can be helpful to know these stages. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I was just, talking with a client about this the other day, you know, who's going to care that you're gone? Well, nobody, then what's, what's standing in the way? Me. Right. Um, (laughs) When we get an an autoresponder from somebody else, oh, they're on holiday. But how dare we, right. Set up an autoresponder on our, on our own email. Right. That's so true. It's so true. (laughs) As, as I try to connect these dots with guests to, to leadership. Yeah. I see some, some habit behavior that, you know, there's the experience, the stages of retreat, Mm -hmm. but as I was just describing, they mirror the decisions that we make and the behaviors that we allow in ourselves and our team and others as a leader, um, that, that it's, it's a bit of a metaphor for, for kind of our, our daily living. Would you, would you, I see you nodding. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, you know, I think that this, this work is so important for leaders specifically, because I think, you know, we have to model 
like healthy behavior across the board. I mean, it's one thing to go into work, the workplace and be like a really powerful leader, but you can't be plugged in like that all the time. I mean, there's a balance, right? There's an interplay here. And it's like, it's like blank space with art, you know, like bright and beautiful art is so wonderful because of the negative space, because of that blank space. If it was all bright and crazy, then you wouldn't appreciate the nuance, you know, and life mm -hmm. is just like that too. It's like, we have to pull back so that we can come back with full power. Otherwise mm -hmm. we can't really access our full power if that makes sense, you know? So mm -hmm. I think leadership, I mean, leaders have to model this behavior, you know, and that's what I think one of the great things from COVID it's like, okay, we've gotten to reevaluate ground down with like who we are and what we're about. And so how are we going to intentionally go back into the workplace or our families and, and model really like healthy and wise behavior. And it doesn't have to just do with like always outputting, you know, like always, yeah. always, always outputting. Yeah. <laughs> so I I'm, think we're I'm treating just picturing. it. Very, yeah. Yeah. I'm just picturing that, that, that manager that's just drowning at his or her desk saying, take care of yourselves guys, you know, right. like, remember to switch off. And, you know, it's 10 o'clock at night and they're at their desk still uh, oh, living I, the values of the organization and living, yeah. the, living the values and modeling as a parent, as a coach, as a, as a leader um, modeling first um, is, is so critical. Yeah, and I get it. I mean, as an entrepreneur myself, it's hard, you know, like mm -hmm. I teach this work and now having my own business, I'm like, oh my gosh, like I could work, I could work all the time and I'll never be done, mm -hmm. you know? So it's, it's really a discipline. I mean, you know, you have to like, for myself and my husband, we have an agreement, you know, that we each separately go on retreat at least once a year, at least. Mm -hmm. And like, I, I try to go twice and that way it's kind of a non-negotiable. It's mm -hmm. not like, should I, where should I? It's like every year, I go, and I tend to go to the same place because again, it takes the choice out of it. <laughs> like mm -hmm. I just go to the same place. I have a different experience every time, of course, because it's based on what I'm kind of working on, but mm -hmm. it's, it's just, it's a discipline, you know, as much as it is people think retreat is like such a luxury and like, sure, in some ways it is a luxury, but if we're going to be proactive about mental health, like it's also a discipline. So yeah, yeah, yeah. for sure. T uh, share with us what your ideal retreat looks like. That's just fires you up and does achieves, you know, the goals that you have for it. So, um, it's different for like the ones I take for myself and then the ones I host for other folks. But, um, so for me, I, I love to just do solo retreats. I go by myself because I think it's, I'm a, you know, I'm pretty plugged in and, um, yeah. especially as a woman too, like we're so communal and we're constantly engaging and socializing and things like that. So it's really valuable for me to just go by myself. I have this little, um, monastery that I go down to in Southern Colorado and it's very austere. I mean, literally there's a bed and a desk and nothing. <laughs> so, wow. so I just wow. bring, you know, my books. I always, so there are nine elements of retreat. And I always say that you have to have these nine elements with you on retreat because sometimes what's happening right now is because retreating is like such a buzz conversation. Um, there are like parties and travel experiences that are, that are like calling themselves retreats that are really mm. more like social gatherings. And there's nothing wrong with a social gathering or a party, nothing wrong with that. I believe it's really different than a retreat. I believe mm -hmm. a retreat has a much higher and deeper spiritual intent. So mm -hmm. one of the one of the elements of retreat is mental um, expansion. So I always tell my people to bring you know a couple of books or maybe a podcast, something in 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 a way that you can stretch yourself. Uh, mm -hmm. So for me, like I'll always bring a book, and if I read too much, sometimes I get tired. So I have a podcast too that I can listen to and check in with. Um, so yeah, me like by myself in this room and then also nature, like reconnecting to basic needs is another one of the nine elements. So mm -hmm. in my day, like being outside, putting my face in the sun and my feet in the dirt and like going up and hiking, I live by the mountains. So the mountains are mm -hmm. always a part of my retreat. Um, so nature is really important. I mean, these are really basic things, you know, but these are things and values that we've gotten so far away from, I think. And so now mm -hmm. we have to be much more intentional about holding the space for that. So, mm -hmm. um, so yeah, so just quiet. I tend to hold silence. The place where I go, it's optional. You can either do silence or not. The retreats I host, I'll have one day of, out of seven, I'll have one day of silence for folks. And that's really intense for people. Um, mm -hmm. But the retreat place where I go, it's like silent the whole time. But that's what I, you know, I like kind of the experience. <laughs> yeah, yeah you're so. modeling you're modeling the behavior <laughs> that you hope to see in others that you lead right tell us about tell us about silence I think silence has so much for us. I mean, I think it's one of the most important like pattern interrupts we can have because again, we're so um, dialed in constantly, you know, we don't think about the um, 
energetic output that it takes even just to like smile at someone at a gas station, you know? So when you have total silence, it's like, it's hard at first and you squirm a bit and you feel like, oh, should I be doing something? Should I be, or like if somebody smiles at you or wants to talk to you and then you're not taught, that can be a little intense at first, but then slowly, slowly, it's like layers start to peel back. And I think there's like this ease that comes as a result of it. There's like this deep comfort and like just feeling settled in yourself. And to me, like, that intangible thing is one of the greatest gifts that you come home with after retreat. It's like a deep sense of just comfort in yourself, you mm -hmm. know, because so much of our habitual talking is transactional and, um, and oftentimes not always true. You know, it's like we're hustling mm -hmm. or we're trying to convince someone or we're trying to sell mm -hmm. something or we're trying, you know, and not mm -hmm. that the, any of that is bad. It's not bad. Mm -hmm. It's part of the world, but mm -hmm. it's just nice to like allow ourselves the space to not have to engage in that way. And so I think mm -hmm. there's, you know, you, you shut that down and there's a lot there for you. You know, I also think like new ideas and inspiration starts to come when you're not constantly outputting here. It's like you close that off and then spaciousness arrives inside the mind and inside the mm -hmm. body it's pretty amazing and you hear in different ways right because if you're used to hearing with your ears and you're not talking and no one's speaking to you it's like you start to feel like sense you know you start to get back into those like innate animal um sensing uh techniques that are so important that we lose touch mm -hmm. with you know mm -hmm. so i think there's a lot there i have a hunch that you have an ability to help share this with people in a way that Oh, how would I describe it? Um, everyday people is not the right word, but um, people to whom this is new in a way that maybe someone with uh, an extreme, okay, I'm, I'm, I'll just cut to the chase. Um, <laughs> there, there's, a, there's a far left hippie out there somewhere doing, you know, silence <laughs> retreats that, that, that everyday Nate's uh, think or not. Yep. And if they just gave it a try, it could be amazing, but there's kind of a block in there. And my, my hunch is that you've had some guests in your retreats that were maybe a little skeptical that for this was maybe new yeah. and you might have an ability to connect with them and your book probably helps it as well. Um, just like make it okay for, for, for someone who hasn't done this kind of thing and, and let them kind of dip their toe in the water. How, how close am I there? Well, thank you. That's like, that's very kind of you. I mean, that's, yeah, I mean, I, I hope so. That's really my, my hope is to be kind of the middle, the middle path, you know? Yeah. So yeah. for the people who are way out here, I'm like, yeah, I shaved my head too. Like I used to meditate in caves too. I got you, you know, and then, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> and then for the people over here, which most of my clients, to be honest, are the, you know, like high powered execs, like, like people who own their own businesses, et cetera. Like that's a lot of my, who my clients are. Mm -hmm. So those people too, like they want to just come and drop into a situation that's, that's held for them. And that's, you know, that's what I'm about. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. So I, I hope to be kind of a middle path, like bringing research and depth of practice, but also like accessibility. I mean, I was a teacher for a long time. So like mm -hmm. connecting with people is really important to me and like mm -hmm. working with all kinds of kids that was like really valuable training for me. Cause now mm -hmm. I just work with mm -hmm. adults, but it's, I mean, I love people. So mm -hmm. all kinds of, all kinds of people. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so thank you for that. <laughs> yeah. We have that in common. I was from a, a household of a coach and a teacher. They're both oh, wow. teachers a long time. And then I taught for a while myself and have spent 20 years in the hockey development space, working with kids. Oh. And now as a certified executive coach, I get to say, I've, I've been working with your children for 20 years <laughs> and now I have something to offer you too. Amazing. It's such good training, right? I mean, yeah. there's no better oh, yeah. kids. Forgiving. Yeah, forgiving. You, you can try stuff. Yes, and uh, and yeah, it's the good good training ground, and um, yes, and then it's so rewarding when uh, you can give an adult a new experience because it's hard for adults to want a new experience uh, that they've never uh, tried before. I really admire people willing to try new things once our habits and behaviors are so ingrained. Totally, and I, you know, I feel like adults are just big kids. Really, I mean, you mm -hmm. know, it's like once we kind of touch in there. It's like, we're all just big kids, you know, mm -hmm. we're just trying to figure it out. We're just trying to do our best. And sometimes we're a little bit stuck in our ways, but I, I think you're right. It's like, we really have to honor the people who are like, you know what, I'm going to try something different because it's not always mm -hmm. easy to do, but mm -hmm. yeah, mm -hmm. adults are just big kids. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And you know, my world of coaching now, it's like, whoa, someone that isn't directly connected to me. I just get to have an hour, a couple of times a month with this person yeah. for me 
I'm a mom, I'm a dad, I'm a leader, whatever. And what it's, it's just for me. And I, I, that's a very strong parallel to a retreat. Like that's just yeah. for the guest or that's participant or the, uh, right. yeah, the practitioner. Yeah. Right. And I mean, and that's, that's so valuable. That's amazing that you get to have that one-on-one time with people. That's so, so valuable. And that's part of my message too, is like, you know, we have this, like, like martyring is like so honored and valued and mm. things like that. But I, I feel like, you know, I, I want to flip the script and be like, you know, when you fill yourself first, then you have so much more to give mm. when you take an hour to speak with you, or you come on a retreat for a weekend with me, it's like, you go home feeling completely full. And so people think like, oh, you're going on retreat. Like there's this subtle, like, kind of like it's selfish or something like self-indulgent yeah. or something like yeah. that. But I don't think that's the case at all. I mean, you go on retreat for the very people. I mean, you speak to you for an hour for the very people that people think you're leaving, you know, it's like, no, yes. that's who you go yes. for. That's what you're doing this for. It's like the outcome of your, or the outputs that you have creatively, the, your workplace, your family, your spouse. I mean, everybody sees the benefit, you know? So it's, yeah it's not just, it's not just yourself. It's, yeah. it's truly for other people. It's an act of like giving. Yeah. So I'm trying to, again, it's messaging is hard for people. Cause you hear like, Oh, I'm going on a retreat. And you think, Oh, yeah. must be nice. No, <laughs> must be nice. Yes. And really important. <laughs> totally. Right? And you can do it too, you know, yeah. and yeah. it's a great ethos to have in a relationship. My husband and I have found, cause it's like, I do my thing. And, you know, we're two different people with different goals and mm -hmm. we come together as full people and mm -hmm. I have my different things and he has his different things and it's so valuable, you know? And, yeah. and so I think it's, it's a great practice to have in a relationship to allow each other that space, you know? Yeah. 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 Right on. Yeah. Well, <laughs> what would an amazing weekend retreat with you look like for someone who is interest whose interest is peaked at the moment <laughs> yeah so so every one of my retreats has a different um intention so one retreat is called ignite and that's a weekend retreat and that's a, we look at the interplay between masculine and feminine energy and how that influences our relationships so mm -hmm. that that's that retreat um, i have another retreat called purify and this one is like a we do a cleanse for a day and then a somatic cleanse too so we so we move a lot of stuck emotion through the body so that one's called purify i have another one that's called honor and it's related to the holidays because holidays can be so wonderful but they can be really triggering too mm -hmm. so it's right before the holidays. So all my retreats have kind of a different intention to them. You know, my big retreat is in Costa Rica. That's a, um, it's called Awaken. And that's like all the things, you know, that's mm -hmm. the big one. Um, so they're all really different, but generally speaking, my retreats, you know, I, I've been a yoga teacher for a long time. So we'll start mm -hmm. with yoga and breath work in the morning and people have breakfast. And then I have what I call heart curriculum. Um, and the idea for this came actually from the Dalai Lama. He used to speak about education and he would say the one thing that's missing in education these days is, is um, studies of the heart, like not just like the health wise, but meaning like like, you know, passion and, and um, sense of love and what we care about and all those, all those kind of intangible emotional pieces, that's what's missing from education, he said. And I, you know, that really stuck with me. So mm. I've created what I call heart curriculum. So I have my heart curriculum. We do that, you know, from like 10 to one or something like that. And then every day people have downtime. So they, some people will, you know, they'll go to hot springs, they'll go surfing, they'll do these kinds of things. And some people will just nap. You know, I have parents who come on my retreat who are just trashed and they need to sleep. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so mm -hmm. it just depends, you know? Um, and then I always have ceremony and ritual. That's a big part of um, retreating for me too. So, you know, we'll join for dinner and, and we'll watch the sunset. And then um, at night we'll do ceremony and ritual. So yeah, mm -hmm. that's kind of the flow of the day and it changes Ugh. based on the intention of the retreat and yes. some retreats are for women i'm getting more and more for men i have um couples ones so there it's kind of evolving <laughs> yeah good for you Thanks. my uh my my brother and his wife are building a house in nosara is it near uh, yeah near yep. there in nosara. Yeah. mine's in right nosara on. it's the cool place my my sister-in-law uh, has started a, a foundation called I Rise Above for uh, younger wow. women dealing with uh, breast cancer, and they do a retreat there in New South ah. Nosara. My hunch is that I can picture this beautiful retreat location. If it's not the same one, it's probably close. I'm so curious where where she does. Yeah, there's a lot of great. I mean, Nosara is it. So for me, every one of my retreats has like the the land, the space has some kind of energetic resonance. So Nosara is a blue. It's in the blue zone, which is there. Are, you know, six places in the world where people are living well over 100 years old. So scientists are flocking oh. to these places to figure out like what's the secret to longevity. You know, so Nosara is in the Guanacaste Peninsula. Which 
which is one of mm -hmm. them. Mm -hmm. Then I have what my other retreats in Colorado, like some are on hot springs, one's on a, you know, a Native American peace ground. So they all have different like mm. significance in the land. You know, that's really important. Being a mountain girl, it's like the, the land is really important to me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But no Tell is amazing. You, yeah. Respecting people's, uh, 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 anonymity in these retreats of course um, yeah. but just tell me of a moment where this kind of everyday person for whom this might be kind of new mm -hmm. just just a, a, a short story of, of something that's coming to mind where someone just went whoa this was I needed this yeah um there's so many and there's lots in my book but um you know one that's coming to mind right now is i had a, a woman who came she's maybe in her 60s who came on one of my retreats in colorado and she had she and her husband had divorced 14 years prior because he did some like illegitimate business dealings or something like that and it was very painful for her i mean it was still you know 14 years later she was embarrassed and she felt anger and she felt a lot of like really intense emotions and she came to this retreat and she um during the break time she went there was a labyrinth on site and she went and kind of walked through the labyrinth and had this like really cathartic moment of cleansing just like crying and sobbing and being like okay i'm gonna let this go and you know i hear from her now regularly and she's her son that they had together is getting married and they both showed up to the wedding which is a huge deal because they hadn't like seen each other interacted nothing you know for 14 years it's been like they've just been trying to avoid each other so now they're at a place where you know they can be in the same room and you know that is significant you know it seems like such mm. a little shift but for her it was like it was massive, you know, because for 14 years, she had just felt so much guilt and responsibility and pain. And so she finally, finally just dropped it, which was a huge deal. So that was significant. I mean, there's so many stories I could tell, but that's one. I had another one just really quick. Um, a woman came and we, at the end of one of my retreats, I have people write a letter to someone that's been, you know, challenging in their life. Mm -hmm. And um, so this woman wrote this letter to her father and um, it was a beautiful letter. You know, it's not like, letters that are telling them why you don't like them or something like that it's like you're appreciating kind of what you've learned from the challenge of the relationship even uh -huh, okay. so she she came home and she actually shared the letter with her father and her father um six months later passed away totally unexpectedly but she had the opportunity as a result of taking the time to do this to mm -hmm. tell her father like why she's why specifically she loved him why she cared about him so that now that he's passed like she doesn't have to carry the feelings of like I never said this I never got to do mm. it I never got to tell him these things and she did mm. it and like to me that's significant mm. you know yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. decades yeah. more peace ahead because of yeah. that opportunity totally absolutely so wow. yeah I'm seeing so many parallels on the impact and maybe I'll kind of bring us to a close with this idea of of the work that you're doing and what leadership coaching can do for leaders in like, well, why should I do this? Well, where are you now? And where do you want to be? And what's in between those two things? Yeah. And if you talk about return on expectations or return on investment, that, that there's no, there's no way to calculate, you know, tangibly the impact of those two stories uh, yeah. that, that you just shared. And other than what's, what, you know, what's the, what's the worst thing that can happen if you don't go and, you yeah. know, what's the best thing that can happen if you do. Yeah. Yes, totally. And I, you know, I, the work that both you and I are doing, it's like, this is how we take care of our inner life, you know? And mm -hmm. I, I think that health, we have this false conception, preconception that it's all about, you know, exercising and eating broccoli. And honestly, it's so much deeper than that. I mean, if your internal mm. life is not doing well, then your external life doesn't even matter what it looks like. It's not going to last for long <laughs> if it's doing well, you know? So really being proactive about that internal landscape, I think is so important and having a coach or taking time to go on retreat is so significant. You know, it yeah. just, it pays dividends in the end and we all need it. You know, there's nobody who's immune to this. We all need this kind of support and um, especially, you know, in, in today's world. I mean, so much of what's normalized is just toxic, you know, mm -hmm. constantly being on, constantly having to output. It's, it's, not, it's not right. It's not healthy. Mm -hmm. So we have to have proactive ways to manage our internal life and having a coach retreating. These are absolutely ways to do it. If you can't take care of yourself, you can't expect to take care of anyone else. Totally. <laughs> Bree, uh, let us know again, uh, what, uh, hold up that book for those watching this yeah. on YouTube and tell us again a little bit about it and where we can find it and where we can track you down. 
Yeah, so you should leave now going on retreat to find your way back to yourself. And it's now on Amazon. My website again is Bree Doyle, B R I E D O Y L E dot com. And it's from there you can get it. Um, so my website's probably the best place to find me. And then I'm pretty active on um, Instagram as well. And that's at Wellbeing by Bree. So those are probably the two most active places. Right on. And we will link to those in the show notes as well. Thank you for awesome. your time. It's been a pleasure. I can't believe it's, uh, it's flown by and I wish you all the best. Thanks so much, Nate. Thanks for having me. Thanks for listening to Leading with Curiosity. Please share, follow, and rate the show so that other leaders can make positive change in the world. Connect with Nate at natelesley.ca. And remember... The brain behaves very differently when encouraged to think rather than told to listen.